This is the PR Podcast, a show about how public relations helps you tell your story to the world. We talk with great PR practitioners who have the skills, creativity, and just plain savvy to get their clients noticed. Now here's your host, Jody Fisher. Hey everyone, and welcome to the PR Podcast. I'm Jody Fisher. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're so happy that we've got, we're seeing so many new subscribers to the show. Every week, our audience seems to build. Uh, and we want to say a big thank you, as we always do, to all the people who are liking, subscribing, and sharing our podcast. Um, not only are we on Apple, Spotify, Google, all the popular podcast platforms, uh, you can also find our show page on anchor.com. And that's a special place that we try to send people to because there's a button you can click there and you can actually record a message. We'd love to hear from you in a way that we can actually share it on the show. So if you're so inclined, visit us on anchor.com, hit that button, send us an audio message. And if we come across something that we enjoy, we want to share with the audience, we'll definitely play that on the show. We are also on all the socials, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, still building that YouTube page. So we'll get there. And we're also syndicated by Kolka Interactive. Uh, that's a website that is local here on Long Island. Um, and Kolka Group is uh, not only a client of mine, but they also uh, have this website called Kolka Interactive, where they share all of their industry knowledge across uh, all the, the people that they work with in their business. So there's lots of contributors on that website. We are one of them, and we're a regularly featured podcast. So check us out on kolkainteractive.com as well. As always, please continue to send your feedback and your questions. We love hearing from all of you. And we've got another terrific guest this week. So let's get right to it. Annie Scranton is the founder and CEO of Pace Public Relations. It's a full service media relations and communications agency based in New York City. PPR strategically customizes and tailors every client's publicity plan to meet specific goals while maximizing their media exposure. And they specialize in TV, radio, print, and web placements. Annie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Tell us a little bit more. We gave that little intro, but tell us a little bit more about Pace Public Relations. This is an agency that you founded yourself. You went out. I remember sitting at lunch with you one day or, or a cup of coffee, and you were telling me the story about how you were going to go out on your own. Tell us about that, that, <laughs> that journey. Well, I'll say that I didn't have like the inclination where I was, I, where I was motivated to go, I got to go start my own agency. It wasn't like this was this like lifelong dream of mine, but um, what happened was I was working um, as a producer, which you mentioned in my, in my intro, I was producing at CNBC um, and the show I was working on, which was Donnie Deutsch's show, um, it was called The Big Idea back in the time, uh, back in the day, and it got canceled. And so I found myself without a job, without very much money in the bank, and um, I didn't know what to do. So I sent out an email to basically everyone in my network, and I got back saying, I need a job. If you know of anything, let me know. And I got an email back that changed the entire course of my life. It was from a publicist who I had uh, worked with closely booking his clients on Donnie's show. And he said, I don't think you've ever done traditional PR work, but I have this client. He just wrote a book on the stock market. It's like a trader, some kind of you know finance guy. If you can get him booked, if you have friends at any of the other shows on CBC, if you think you can get him booked, you know, I'll pay you whatever, you know, 500 bucks and, and we'll, you know, we'll go from there. And I said, Oh, well, let me see, you know? So I, I messaged my friend in the newsroom and I sent her the info and she was like, he sounds great. Can he come on the show on Friday? And so I realized at that moment that I held this kind of special currency, if you will, um, which was that I knew closely and personally uh, many different producers at many different networks and shows because I had worked at so many of those places and I was friends with so many of those producers, like close personal friends, not just, you know, work colleagues. Um, and that there was a real need for, um, for, for, for business leaders, for CEOs, for companies, you know, to get the exposure um, from broadcast television. And, you know, I, m our firm, Pace PR, clients retain us to get them all forms of traditional media, which, you know, means TV, radio, print, and digital. But 
we're still very, very well known for our capabilities in television because it's really the hardest medium to get your client on. Um, probably just because there's not as much real estate, so to speak. There's only so many networks, only so many shows, you know, whereas if you're thinking of digital exposure, you know, there's 7 million different websites where you could get your client quoted or get an op-ed published or something like that. Um, and so I just realized, I just said, oh, like maybe there's something here, you know, in terms of like a career pivot. And um, <clears throat> I wound up getting a job at HLN, which I accepted and did full time um, for about a year and a half after I got laid off from CNBC. But I kept kind of doing the PR thing on the side. I, I, I would talk to guests in the green room and I'd say, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about going out on my own. What do you think? Like, would you have a need to hire somebody like me? And um, just, it was right around what, after I turned 30 and I just said, you know what? It's like, it's now or never. Um, I, I had, I had gotten a, a modest amount of money from NBC as my severance. So I knew I had like a little bit of money in the bank. I had parents that were not going to let me go homeless. And I just figured, you know what? It's kind of like now or never. Let me, let me try it. And so that's what I did. And that was 10 years ago. I started out just working for my studio apartment and you know, here we are 10 years later, we have 10 employees, 40 clients, you know, doing, doing a lot of really fun and exciting projects. That is, there's so much to unpack there. And it's such a great story um, from the, um, the way you describe sort of the now or never, while you're also balancing the, the real practical um, elements of your life. I mean, having, having a little bit of severance, so having that financial runway, you know, not being foolhardy. Um, and that's something that that I had to assess too when I was going into the business that I run now um, is is you know am I going to be able to pay my bills at the same time that I'm trying to get this thing off the ground? Um, you also talked about the currency that you have that you built up um, as a former employee of a broadcast network, having having that network of peers that you can go to and rely on for that. And that is really sort of the, the big, you know, unlock, I think, in, in what we do is knowing not only how to do it, but who to go to, right? And, and while I'm not a huge fan of it's not what you know, it's who you know, sometimes it is who you know, right? <laughs> well, I mean, especially, I think in particular, when it comes to broadcast television, yes, I do think actually knowing producers really, really helps and makes a big difference. You certainly don't have to know the producers personally in order to get your clients um, or to get a, an interview booked on a TV network or, a, you know, a various show. But um, the issue with producers is that they are getting just, I mean, I, I'm going back 10 years when I was producing and I would get literally probably like 200 pitch emails a day, you know? So you're constantly getting barraged with pitches that are just getting deleted, just completely deleted without even read. If they don't recognize the sender who is sending them the email or unless it has a perfect, very relevant subject line, you know, that is going to say to the producer, let me take the three seconds to open this email and to read the first couple of sentences to see if this is worth my time. Um, so I think it's just because of the, the urgency and the sort of the way that producers work, which is if you're talking cable news, you know, it's every 24 hours, you're producing a new show, you know, you got to deliver, you have to have a new segment produced, new guest booked. And so it's just a very fast paced environment um, where you don't have time necessarily to read all these pitches and be thoughtful and reply. And, you know, it's, it's different. Like when you're pitching, um, you know, a newspaper reporter or a long form producer, you know, they have more time to really dive into subjects. So it's, it, it is, it is good to know like p producers, but now with, you know, I tell, I tell people all the time who maybe don't have the budget for PR or they, or they just want to try to, you know, make some inroads on their own. I mean, everyone's on social media. Everyone has a public footprint. So it's not hard to find out who's producing for which show. And it's also not hard to like see what they're tweeting about, you know, and, and watch the show that they're on every day. There are like simple things you can do to make yourself um, more knowledgeable, if you will. And, and that will help you to craft a better pitch. Yeah. Simple research, I think, goes a long, long way. Um, oh, let's yeah. drill down, though, on that, um, uh, on what you mentioned about, you know, recognizing the name of the person who's sending you that email pitch um, mm -hmm. and or having that relevant 
subject line or first couple of sentences. You know, the way that I've done pitching email, especially email pitching over the last few years has, has evolved, um, I think with the times and, and hopefully I've gotten a little bit better at it. Um, how do you approach, um, what you say in those first couple of lines. Do you have either a formula that you think that works or do you just have sort of a philosophy or, or a way you like to approach it? Um, you know, is it personal? Does it hit hard with facts? How do you, how do you go about crafting those couple opening lines? Well, for TV producers, I, I get, I, I'm always trying to get to it and to get to it as quickly as possible. Um, because as I mentioned, they just like, don't have the time to like read a whole long, you know, build up, if you will, to the actual meat of what you're trying to pitch. Um, and the other thing to remember is, you know, for producers, like they don't need a recap of the news. So if you're pitching somebody to talk about Giuliani's press conference the other day, you don't need to say like yesterday, Giuliani gave this press conference in which A, B, and C happened. Like they're, they're news producers. They already know the press conference happened. So you right. just have to say basically for expert commentary on the le the veracity of Giuliani's press conference available for interviews is X, you know, and then, um, and then try to just put in whatever it are the qualifiers from their bio, that's going to be the most impactful. So basically, you know, whatever is their top bragging rights, like the top thing about them, put that front and center. And then right after that, just get right into what your guest would say. So, you know, my client says that, you know, it, the Trump campaign has zero shot of a recount, you know, and this is why, or whatever the case may be, it could be the opposite opinion, but the producers want to know what the guest is actually going to say on air. And, um, you know, these are obviously referred to as talking points, you know, um, in our industry. And so without those talking points, we try to just bullet them, you know, so that way it's, it's very clear and very easy um, for the producers to read. And that's basically it, um, you know, because for, for TV producers, especially they're under the gun, they're looking for guests and they, a lot of times too, um, they need a very specific point of view. So their senior producer may say, we want to do a debate. So we need someone who thinks that Giuliani is the greatest and we need somebody who thinks he's the worst, you know? And so it's great if you can put in really, really strong talking points, you know, um, that are always truthful, always honest, you know, always sort of um, in line with what you're, we never want a client to, to lie or say something they don't believe, but you know, it's okay to kind of go there um, in terms of exactly how you would express your viewpoint, because that may, that may help you to get that booking. Yeah. I think that's such an important call out is to push your client to um, really define precisely what they are going to say, because that's the whole reason that a producer would book someone on a show as a guest, right? I mean, they, they don't want to just know, you know, it's, it's Jody Fisher and he's an expert on PR. Would you like to talk to him? It's here's what he thinks about this particular subject that we know that you're reporting on, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's, exa that's exactly right. You have to make sure that you know what is in the wheelhouse of that producer and of that show, you know, um, because even if they don't, they don't choose to book your guest, at least they are going to walk away with a favorable opinion of you because they know that you pitch something that is relevant and that is very timely and current and in line with the type of segments that their that show um, typically produces. Yeah, a mentor of mine at Rubenstein used to be fond of saying, it's not about this hit, it's about the next hit. It's about the next time you interface with that producer or that editor or that reporter because that's how you build a relationship. 100%. I mean, you know, I have a file in my inbox that's called producers. And every time I have any interaction with a producer, it goes into that folder because I'm going back to that producer 
you know, every week, every couple of weeks or whatever to try to exactly what you said, just build on that relationship, get the next hit, hit with, with that show, with that, with that reporter. Um, and you know what? I say that to my clients too. It's like, I always say, okay, I want you to do a great job on your first interview, but it's not to do a great job. So you can walk away having this amazing piece of press for your company, which you will, but it's really you doing it so that way you can get that second interview. So that way you can keep getting asked back. So you could become a thought leader um, because, you know, for the clients too, obviously that's how they grow their presence in the media as well. PR has obviously changed a lot over the last 10 or 20 years. And, you know, I'm thinking of going back to when I started in the 1010 Wins newsroom and one of my jobs as a desk assistant was restocking the fax machine. I think you'd be <laughs> hard pressed to even find a fax machine uh, in, in a newsroom now, right? Um, yeah. How do you, how have you seen uh, media and public relations changing over the last, you know, 10 years that you've been running your own agency um, and then even before that, when you're on the other side of the fence, how have things evolved or, or changed uh, about the industry? Well, I mean, I think in the most general sense, just how we consume news um, and the media has changed dramatically in the past 10 to 20 years. Um, you know, just TV, you know, it used to be a cable box and that was it. That was your only option. You know, now there's all various options for streaming. Um, so many more people are cord cutting and, you know, that is going to keep evolving as a trend and as the way that we consume TV news. I mean, there's so many there's so many apps on your smartphone, on your smart TV that are delivering news, you know, like Pluto TV has the first the first TV, which is a conservative news network. You know, something just saying the words, the app on your smart TV didn't exist you know, like five years ago. So there's and and from and from five years from now, probably how we consume, you know, when you go to your guide and you're going through CNN, Fox, MSNBC, E! News, whatever, that's probably going to change too. It's probably going to move into more of like an a la carte model where you pick and choose which stations and shows you want to subscribe to and pay and pay that way. Um, you know, for, for us publicists, it's been, I think, a great thing in the sense that there are so many more outlets that you can go to for your clients now. Um, and that's great because there's just more opportunity and, and not just in, in television, but I, it's certainly in digital as well, um, for sure. But I would say in terms of how like sort of booking the news and PR has changed the most dramatically in the past 10 years is that, you know, 10 years ago, the news cycle meant something completely different than what today's news cycle means, you know, um, especially over the past four to six years, you know, um, with, with, with the Trump presidency and leading up to um, the 2016 election, the news cycle really only meant Trump. And, and the tentacles, you know, that, that, that reached out from, from him and from that administration. So, you know, if you go back eight years ago, um, on any given day, on any of the cable news outlets in an hour, you would, of course, have a political news story, but you would also have a medical news story. You would have a tech news story. You'd talk about, a, you know, what the stock market was doing, what the economy was doing. You'd maybe talk about the biggest international news story of the day. So there was just more of a mix. Um, and I think that most people enjoyed that more than just sort of like this, this constant barrage in your face, you know, that we're getting on cable news these days. I do think that's going to change again, um, you know, with, with the president elect and just, I think people are a little bit like burnt out. And, and I think we're also leaving a lot of important news stories on the table, you know, in sectors that are not just in politics. Um, so I am hoping that, that, that trend will come back, but you know, like eight years ago when I would represent a medical doctor, you know, or a tech expert, they were able to get on TV like almost weekly, you know, national TV to talk about as a thought leader, whatever the big story of the day is, that has changed dramatically, um, certainly in terms of, you know, what's being covered on broadcast television. Yeah, I agree so much with everything you just said. I am certainly looking forward to uh, the, the news. I, I feel like the news cycle has accelerated and, and we don't even have I mean, what we used to have was sort of like an AM news cycle, a PM news cycle, or a 12-hour or a 24-hour. I, I just feel like it's just like you said, it's just this constant 
um, you know, foot on the gas, pedal to the floor kind of news cycle where it just doesn't stop. Um, well, and, and it's really revved up, like with the election. I mean, it's accelerated, you know, like, right? It, yeah, like my, I mean, like literally, there was like, a, you know, four or five days there where, I mean, I would just wake up and immediately turn on CNN, you know, and like it would just be on like all day because. And it's like they've been on for four hours partying and it's <laughs> hanging from the ceiling, right? It's crazy. And I, I think we're all just ready to have a little more regularity, a little more like normalcy in sort of how we, how we, what our relationship is with the news because, you know, it's not necessarily healthy. <laughs> We we t yeah, I, I agree with you. I think we could all just <laughs> let, let's just like take a week. Let's just all agree to take a week and we just <laughs> unplug. <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> uh, I think I know I could use it. I'm sure you could too. Um, we talked about relationships a bit, and and you know what you were just saying has got me thinking. We talk about relationships with reporters and with editors, um, as well as relationships with clients. I wonder if there is a sort of by extension, is there a relationship with the audience? Because, you know, I, I frequently explain to clients that um, when we're trying to get a reporter interested, you have to see um, your information through the eyes of the audience that the reporter is reporting to, right? So, so Newsday, for example, on Long Island is focused on the Long Island audience, whereas mm -hmm. CNBC is focused on a business audience. You know, maybe everybody who's on Wall Street or who's in, you know, uh, financial firm offices and they've got the TV on up there in the corner of the office or whatever. You've, you've got to see what you're trying to say and view it through the eyes of the audience that is consuming that information. Um, is there a PR relationship with that, with those audiences? Um, I know it's kind of yeah. a philosophical question, but. Well, yeah. I mean, because anytime, you know, that I'm pitching a, a reporter, a journalist, producer, what have you, I, I always think of what will he or she be interested in, but I always think of who's going to be reading or watching or listening to the outlet that I'm pitching. And if you don't try to put yourself in the shoes of, of the viewer, of the reader, of the audience, then you're likely, you have more, a higher chance of missing the mark, you know, in terms of how you craft your pitch. So yes, I do, I do think that's incredibly, incredibly important um, to keep in mind. And, you know, it's not to say that you have to live in that area or you have to have grown up there or know somebody there, but, you know, it's, it's really just about being thoughtful and taking the time to research the reporter you're reaching out to read the local paper online, follow them on Twitter, you know, just to get a sense of the tone and tenor for how they put together um, their publication. And, you know, by, by taking those small steps in a small amount of time, um, I think it's definitely going to be to your advantage. I know that you have a lot of uh, young up and comers in your audience, a lot of, uh, I'm sorry, in your agency, uh, mm -hmm. lots of people who are very young and talented. Um, but you have to, you, part of a job of, of a senior member of a firm and certainly the founder of a firm is, is cultivating that talent, right? And, and helping them along, uh, helping them get better at their craft. What kind of talents do you look for in a PR person? Or if someone is coming up through the ranks, you know, and they think they want to, maybe they're in school and they're studying PR or they're starting to get out in the world and they're, you know, they've got a PR job, but is it for me? I don't know. What kind of talents do you think make a great PR person? Um, certainly strong writing skills, I think is far and away the number one, um, talent. Um, you know, it is our job as senior members of the team to share with, uh, with, with new members or junior members, you know, sort of how we put together our pitches and examples of past pitches and press releases, et cetera. So they could get a sense of how we normally craft them, but we have unfortunately had, um, junior members of the team over the years who, who, who did not have acceptable um, writing skills um, for having a, a college degree. And, um, you know, it was, uh, so, so that now we do, we've learned, and now we do a writing test um, for everybody who comes on board. Because as you know, all of pitching is done over email. It's all done written. So if you, you we don't have the time 
to teach a recent college graduate how to write, you know, how to correctly and grammatically put together a sentence and construct a paragraph and a pitch. Um, we're there to help them finesse and to nuance and to understand, you know, um, tactics that will be more appealing to a journalist when they're reading it. Um, so I would say if, if you're, you know, graduating or looking for your first job and you even remotely question your writing skills, invest in some sort of other course um, or something uh, to help you beef up on those. Um, I would say for me and for our firm, we, we always are wanting to hire people who have a lot of interests um, and who just are interested in the news and lifestyle and pop culture, you know, in, in a lot of different areas because Pace PR is a, is a generalist firm. We have clients running the entire spectrum. And if you don't like sort of just, you know, consume all of those different areas um, of life, then you're not going to be able to creatively put together, you know, different pitch ideas as well, because some pitching like for TV and cable news is very black and white. You know, you look up on the TV, you see what Fox News is covering and you pitch that, you know, because you know, they're going to keep covering it for that day. But <laughs> if you're pitching, uh, you know, a features reporter at a magazine, they may be looking for a trend, you know, um, that they haven't spotted. And um, the people who are putting together the smartest trends and putting together the smartest pitches are doing so because they are, they are calling upon real life experience and, you know, and just their sort of general knowledge. Um, so I think that's really important too. Yeah. The, the writing, uh, definitely I have come across people who are not the level of writer they should be for having completed a college degree. Uh, yes. and, and it's pretty remarkable. Uh, remarkable is definitely one way to put it. It's crazy. I mean, and, you know, <laughs> yes, especially as being somebody who's such a grammar phobe, you know, and so, um, and really uh, despises, um, you know, like. Well, that could be a surefire way to lose an opportunity with a, with a reporter or someone you're pitching. I mean, if, if they open, I mean, they write for a living, right? Uh, in yeah. one way or another. And if they're opening up a pitch and the first thing they see is this glaring, Let's not even talk about, you know, the comma in the wrong place. Let's just talk about misspelled words, typos, or just sentences that don't make sense. They don't even bother trying to wade through it, right? They just delete and it's gone. Yeah. It could be the greatest idea in the world, but it won't see the light of day because it's just constructed so poorly. 100%. And I, I think also like, you know, there's, you can't like, I think that more a lot of publicists almost fall into this trap too of being like a little robotic when they're reaching out to reporters or producers, you know, and like saying like, okay, the intro to my pitch, here's the meat of it and here's the ending, you know, which is fine. But um, I always tell people, journalists are people too, you know, and so you don't necessarily have to be so formal you can be more informal or try to have a, 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 a little bit of a personal touch to how you're reaching out to somebody, but in no way is it acceptable to have, you know, a spelling or grammatical error, um, you know, especially if it's like somebody you've never worked with before and it's the first time you're pitching them. I mean, you know, it's <laughs> right. just going to, it's just not going to bode well for you at all. And do we start the pitch with hope you are well? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, like if I mean, these you days really, you might, right? <laughs> well, if you really know the person, sure. Like if there's somebody you, you really know, yeah, sure. I hope you're well. But if it's somebody you do not know at all, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think so because it comes across as disingenuous. What I think would be better is to say, you know, I really enjoyed reading your Twitter thread on yeah, X and, you know, something like that. Because the other thing to remember too, is that, and I can say this as a former journalist, you don't get paid a lot of money. You know, it's, it's a really, it can be a very thankless job. And so um, it's just going to irk them if you are, if you're not paying attention to the details. But on the other hand, if you genuinely took the time to read their most recent stories and you developed an opinion on it and you share that opinion with them in, in a genuine brief way, I do think it's going to, it's going to increase the likelihood that they'll get back to you. 
Yeah, this is great. You, you and I could probably go back back and forth forever here. Um, yes. <laughs> but we're going we're gonna to move on to our next section. And we, uh, we have started now at the end of the podcast, stealing a page from inside the actor's studio, where we ask our guests a series of rapid fire questions. And these are just simple little uh, one word or one sentence answers, Annie. Um, okay. You know, maybe they're good for a laugh or two, but let's let's see where it takes us. All right. So number mm -hmm. one, rapid fire question. Your favorite news source. Uh, favorite news source, probably CNN. Favorite social media platform. TikTok. Oh, I, I got to talk to you about TikTok because <laughs> I don't know how to use it. <laughs> It's, right, so number, addic it's so uh, addicting. <laughs> my, my kids just sit there and scroll through it and just, and I watch some of it, but I, I, I don't know how to use it. So I got to, we, we got to talk about that offline. We'll talk. All right. Uh, number three, coffee or alcohol? It, can it be both or it can't? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> coffee in the morning, alcohol after work. Uh, there you go. But in all, in all honesty, probably I would have to pick coffee. I do not think I could survive without it. <laughs> yeah, the same, same. Uh, number four, favorite on-the-run food? On-the-run food, probably like chicken fingers or chicken nuggets from Chick-fil-A or any other fast food place. I can tell you have a little one at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and number five, what do you want to be after you finish this career? A professor. Oh, nice one. All right. Mm -hmm. A professor of public relations or something else? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Of PR. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. All right. We'll yeah. keep that in mind. You get, you've got a long way to go, so don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> well, this has been a great conversation, Annie. Thank you so much. Please, please let people know how they can find you online. Sure. So our website is pacepublicrelations.com. Um, and you could find me on Twitter. It's at Annie Scranton. All right. Thanks again, Annie. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Please remember to subscribe to the show. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The PR Podcast and send us a question or a comment. We'll see you next time on The PR Podcast.